Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump in here. Um, some of you may have attended our previous field tours, but this is the third virtual field tour we've ever done, ever. <laughs> and uh, this is part of a series of nine virtual field tours this year. So these are replacing our in-person field days that we've typically done in August and September uh, on our OSU sites, as well as participant farms, just to share what um, how things are performing in the field. And uh, I hope that the the chat box isn't necessarily a replacement from all about for all those side conversations and connections and information sharing that happens, but hopefully we can still have some of that here. And uh, definitely want to acknowledge all of our sponsors. We've um, our project has really grown this year, and the potato variety trials are just one is one of many uh, active projects, as you can see here on our list. And uh, I also just want to note here at the bottom of this screen is a link, and this is where all of these field days will be archived. And uh, so if you know somebody who would like to would like to have uh, attended today, but wasn't wasn't able, they'll be able to um, view this recording later. Uh, and just a couple other notes. Um, if you turn off your video, um, it will might improve your ability to see our videos that we're sharing. So that would improve the quality. But if for some reason, the quality of the videos doesn't come through right now, they will be captured in the recording more clearly. So uh, fingers crossed technology will work for us today. But if for some reason, you aren't able to see things clearly or hear things clearly, that should be able to be captured in the recording for you to see later. All right. So I just want to also acknowledge uh, all of our, so all the sponsors listed here on this first slide were, had actively contributed to our field tour today. So uh, we'll get to see Gail's Meadow Farm and Marion Polk Food Share, um, Chris Homanix with Head, Hands, and Heart. So this is a little outline of what we're going to be covering today. We're going to go over the 2019 potato variety trial results uh, briefly, and then uh, outline the varieties that we selected from uh, for to trial in 2020. A little bit about the protocol that we um, all the participating farms um, received, and also a timeline, like what our timeline looked like. Uh, approximately on some of these different sites for planting, hilling, and harvesting. And then uh, we have our, our guest uh, guest host here, uh, Crystal Mannix, has helped us uh, select and, and, and has consulted with us on these dry farmed uh, potato variety trials. And we'll get to hear from a couple of our participating farms there. And we'll also be presenting some preliminary data uh, from this year's trials. So it doesn't include all of our uh, varieties yet, but we will be sharing some uh, data from this year as well. So in the chat box, we'll be sharing um, one, of, uh, one of the folks on our team will share a handout. Uh, so at our winter meeting uh, back in February this year, uh, we created a handout that outlined the results from our potato variety trials. So I'm going to highlight some things here right now, but you can um, can view this uh, in more detail on that link that they'll share. So these are the varieties that we grew uh, last year, and the yield on this uh, table here is averaged across sites. So um, things uh, varied quite a bit from site to site. And um, if I just bring your attention down uh, at the very bottom, uh, you'll see purple Peruvian. Uh, and for example, the average yield per plant across sites was around 2.7 pounds per plant. But I can tell you on a couple of the sites that we uh, oversaw, we saw eight to 10 pounds per plant on that variety. So uh, that just gives you an idea of how much um, sites vary. And, the very first virtual field tour was on uh, site suitability. So uh, everybody's on a different site with different soil types and different microclimates. So all that plays into uh, how these results play out on your site. So just a snapshot of our yield data from uh, 2019, we did have eight participating sites. 
So uh, on, on this graph, you can see the abbreviations for the varieties. Uh, and on the far left, um, that's yield per plant on the y-axis and all the varieties listed there across the x-axis. And the different co colors represent earliness. So blue is late. And you can kind of see there's several blue bars there at the, on the left-hand side of that graph indicating uh, that they yielded more. So we did uh, see purple Peruvian, purple abundance, red Pontiac, and German butterball, just the, fir the first few that I, I mentioned there as uh, varieties that were uh, quite a bit uh, higher yielding across sites compared to on the right hand side, you can see more early varieties or the pink bars. So that's the last two there, all blue and warba. Another thing that we had the opportunity to investigate last year uh, is a solar co-location. So I'll be showing a video uh, from um, our site there, but there we got to uh, plant those out in partial shade and full sun uh, in the aisleways between the solar panels. So um, a lot of the varieties uh, you can you can see purple Peruvian is also on the left side of this graph, this left side of this graph, and you can see the red bars are the sunny, uh, the yield of the sunny location. And then the blue bars, the yield of the shady location. And um, on this next slide, you'll see that we based a, a summary of what we saw there is the potatoes yielded nine and a half percent more per plant in the shade on average. And that trend was seen in 11 of the 13 varieties. So a couple of the higher yielding varieties, purple Peruvian and red Pontiac there on the left, actually uh, yielded less um, in the shade. But the other 11 varieties to the right of that, um, Chieftain, Purple Majesty, Yukon Gem, Elfie, German Butterball, Strawberry Paw, et cetera, those all uh, yielded more in the shade. So that was an interesting effect. And we are continuing that uh, study as part of the INSPIRE project with the National Renewable Energy Lab and um, for this year as well as next year. So we. Uh, with our 2019 potato uh, variety trials, um, these are just some, um, some key points. Uh, the later varieties did uh, tend to out outperform the early varieties, but they did have smaller tubers. So uh, another thing that we did with all those tubers after harvesting them was uh, we took a sample and put them in storage. So this top table um, was uh, from December 31st. Uh, you have all the varieties across and across the columns there and then on the uh, along the side you can see percent rotten and percent sprouted so on december 31st uh, we had quite a bit of um, purple peruvians that were rotten they had some soft spots on them uh, even though it was a higher a high yielding variety for us last year we did see a lot rotten uh, in that first sa sampling from our storage potatoes and there's quite a few other varieties that sprouted. And that second table right below that, uh, so we had two uh, sample dates for our storage potatoes. So there's 1231, uh, which you can see laid out in this table above. And then there's a second sample date that we looked at in uh, February, on February 11th of this year. So these were potatoes harvested and the, after the 2019 or during the 2019 growing season we pulled them out in February and the only two left uh, to speak of were purple Peruvian and uh, purple abundance. So of those um, purple abundance um, had a lot, um, a lot less rotten and sprouted at that time. So that is a great storage potato. And that is one that is not commercially available yet, but Chris Homanix, the potato breeder we're working with, and that's one variety that he has been developing over the years. So uh, we'll look forward to continuing that one and um, hopefully that will be released for us all someday. So in, in summary, um, determining what your market demands uh, are and then using the table in the handout, which is in the chat box there to determine what combination of earliness, yield and storage work best for you. And another thing that we do with our potato variety trials is we often participate uh, in tasting events. So we 
had a tasting event with Slow Food Corvallis last year in November. And we selected uh, these varieties listed here on that bar graph um, to be boiled and made into chips. And we had about 80 per people participate in that tasting. And you can see purple Peruvian and lily were two of the, um, two of the favorite varieties. Um, and we've also participated in an event called the Variety Showcase where we partnered with um, uh, the Culinary Breeding Network and a chef, um, Tim Wastel, prepared the potatoes, Purple Peruvian and Purple Abundance were the varieties we featured in that event. And um, folks got to try those prepared different ways as well. So it's not just about yield and storage, there's also flavor. And um, so some of the varieties uh, we've selected uh, have been be for uh, traits such as flavor as well. So of the data that we had last year, these were varieties that the Dry Farming Collaborative uh, liked that stood out in our tastings and or were high yielding or, um, and or had good storage. So for 2020, um, we had intentions of getting uh, certain varieties but discovered that some of them are commercially, were commercially unavailable. So purple Peruvian is a variety that was sold out um, and was replaced uh, with French fingerling. Uh, we wanted to get lily again, since it was a standout variety at the tasting, but it was also commercially unavailable. Uh, and then also Maca Ozette was one that was highly recommended uh, by multiple people and we were unable to get that one. There was a small amount of seed potatoes that some farmers and growers had held back and provided. Um, Al LePage uh, was able to give us some purple Peruvians, uh, but we planted those just out on isolated non-commercial sites since they weren't certified seed potatoes. So uh, it's just a notable um, thing that uh, get a consistent source of organic seed potatoes. Um, some of these varieties come and go. So, I think that we have a lot of work to do in having consistent access to some of these standout varieties. And uh, Chris Homanix is hopefully gonna help us with that. So I took this picture yesterday. Um, we haven't started harvesting all of our varieties, but I wanted you to see uh, what the tubers looked like. Uh, I'm a visual learner and so um, this means more to me than that table we saw before. So on the top, uh, the top row, the Corolla, the Caribe, the German Butterball, French Fingerling, and Red Pontiac, those are all some of the varieties that are early, some of the ones we have already commenced harvest on and some we're almost finished with. And on the bottom are some of the, um, still a couple early varieties, Desiree and Cyclamen are fairly early, um, but the last three, Pinto Gold, Belmonda, and Papacacho, are definitely some of the last that we'll be harvesting on some of our plots. So our protocol with our um, eight uh, participating sites this year, uh, we had uh, some people participating in replicating all 10 varieties. And as we ran out of tubers, there were some sites that uh, were partial participants, um, maybe replicating uh, three or four varieties based on our availability. So for one replication, um, there's uh, 10 tubers planted two feet apart. So in an irrigated situation, I think this common spacing is about one foot apart. Uh, so we're giving them twice as much space. So that little um, schematic there is like uh, 20 row feet with 10 tubers. And so to, in order to do three replications of one variety, you would, they, a participant would need 60 row feet. And so we were asking participants to replicate the varieties we provided uh, three times. So for one variety, that'd be 30 tubers and, uh, um, and re randomize that in their plot if possible. So that's a lot to ask for some commercial farms, but that's what we were doing on our research sites. And I think some of our participants were able to pull that off as well. Uh, we were asking um, to, excuse me, hill the plot when they're about one uh, foot tall. And some of the later varieties uh, likely would need a second hilling. And uh, we ask uh, participants not to irrigate. Now there are some uh, sites where soil conditions or just life and timing uh, don't allow for ideal planting time. 
So one uh, irrigation is acceptable, but not after that, because our goal here is to assess these varieties under dry farm conditions. So we're harvesting the plants when they're mostly died back or um, mostly yellow and brown. We're not pulling them when they're green, just so we can have some uniformity in our, in our results. And this just gives you a little bit of a timeline here. So for several of the sites um, that we're managing here um, at OSU, uh, that just gives you an idea of planting. Our early site um, uh, was actually, I thought it was March, but it was actually April 14th. I looked back in our notes. Um, and then we had an early um, May planting in Corvallis and then mid-May in Salem. So this just gives you a snapshot and every site, every participant site had a different timeline. So they were um, basing their timing of planting and hilling, et cetera, on their site conditions. And, and those definitely are uh, vary from site to site. So now we're gonna get into uh, some of our videos. Uh, we've kind of captured these. This is the first one. Um, I think even our first test run using a camera and a tripod out here to do this sort of thing. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. This is obviously from July 13th and from one of our sites in Albany, Oregon. Behind me, we have our potato variety trials. Uh, this is one of eight sites participating this year, and we're evaluating 10 varieties in the dry farm, under dry farm conditions. And um, at this point, um, these potatoes were planted in March. This is our first potato planting this year. And some of the plants are starting to, um, they've already flowered and are starting to die back. And we can uh, definitely, when you look out over the field, see some differences in the varieties. For example, uh, this variety next to me is papacacho, and it's a very tall statured plant with, uh, with, that's flowering currently. And adjacent to me, uh, we have uh, corolla, which is a much lower growing uh, potato variety. And uh, one thing I noticed that's uh, relevant, uh, that would be relevant to uh, everyone is um, how you're hilling. So if you're hilling with a G tractor, um, these plants, when I went through, I originally cultivated with a G tractor the first time, and uh, it kind of knocked the plants over. So um, I think that the BCS tractor would work much better for this variety for hilling. Um, so beyond that, we're going to be collecting data from all of our participants this year, looking at yield and quality of these uh, potatoes, and probably uh, doing some tastings. So we will report these results this winter after we've got all our, got all our data in and be sharing that uh, with you um, in various forms. And what's the soil type here where these are growing? Yes, this is a Ch Chehalis silt loam. So um, I stuck a shovel in here earlier and it's quite dry down to a foot depth, but you can see that there um, doesn't seem to be any moisture stress in this field. The potatoes are looking pretty healthy. Any um, Anything that you see starting to die back is doing so naturally because they've been in the ground for uh, three months or so. So this next video is just a, a time-lapse video that shows hilling. I mentioned the BCS tractor. We have a, a hiller furrower implement that we use. So uh, this is gonna be uh, hilling um, uh, really briefly. Uh, at the solar site in Salem, Oregon. So that was um, our first time using the time-lapse feature, but uh, trying to uh, capture just uh, how we did things out in the field. Uh, this next video is uh, Cassandra Waterman harvesting one of our potato plots. So one of our potato plots is 20 row feet with 10 uh, potato plants spaced two feet apart. 
So you'll get to see um, har her harvest that really quickly and then see what one, um, one plot or 10 potato plants yields for one variety. So now you've got a little glimpse of what some of our uh, field operations looked like. And uh, this next clip is um, highlighting what we were seeing on July 31st at that site in Albany, Oregon. All right, we're here in Albany on July 31st, harvesting some potatoes. Uh, so we've been harvesting a few varieties here that I'm going to show you. We've been collecting data, counting and weighing. So um, this first variety here uh, is French fingerling. And these are a lot bigger than we imagined they would be. So um, like I said, we're counting and weighing all these. Cassandra is working on that behind me here. And uh, this variety we harvested earlier at the other, another site in, uh, near Philomath. And these are giant, these are Caribe. So um, I've heard really good things about these from Cassandra. And uh, yeah, they'll, at the other side, they were yielding about 45 pounds per plot. So, and then we have a couple plots here of German butterball. And uh, just for reference, each one of these totes represents the yield of 10 plants. So that's about one plot for us. One replication of each variety is 10 potato plants. So German butterball, um, yeah, these are looking pretty good, a bit smaller than the Curie Bays. And then um, these last three over here are uh, Corolla. So um, this is, uh, we're just harvesting this today, but these were definitely the first variety I noticed to completely dry down and be ready for harvest. That's what we've been doing. We've been waiting for, we're not harvesting the plants when they're green. We're waiting till they're completely um, dr dried down before we harvest and just so we're uniform in our data collection. And um, yeah, so we'll be uh, reporting these results as well. And uh, that's it for now. All right, so just a snapshot. This is uh, the data that we collected that day. This is um, the varieties that we harvested first. And that this is uh, compiled from uh, two sites. So you can see them pictured down below, not in the same order, uh, actually, that they're presented in the table above, but Caribe and Corolla, uh, German Butterball and French Fingerling were definitely the four, first four varieties that we were harvesting at the end of uh, July. And in this graph, we uh, have marketable and unmarketable yield. So towards the end of this presentation, we'll talk about what the unmarketable tubers uh, were experiencing. And I can just tell you uh, as a preview, there was a lot of rodent damage. We've had a lot of bull and gopher and rodent issues this year. So the Corolla had the most uh, rodent damage on that day. There was some on the French fingerling and a tiny bit on the Caribe and German butterball. So next, uh, we're going to have a nice overview from Chris Homanix, who is our fearless potato leader and breeder in this project and has helped us 
select varieties and uh, assess results and then share that back with folks in the winter. So he's going to go over uh, some things to be looking for and, and what our kind of overall goals are in this project. It is August 12th and today we are at Sunbow Farm here in Southwest Corvallis. Uh, my name is Chris Mannix and with Amy Garrett we're overseeing the Dry Farming Collaborative's potato project. Um, I am a pipe reader and seed saver and for about the past 10 years I've been evaluating um, hundreds of different potato varieties uh, looking at uh, diverse things from disease resistance um, to productivity, uh, different colors and flavors, um, and different genetics from different potato species um, in Pacific Northwest organic conditions. And so specifically what we're looking at here in this trial is uh, potatoes that excel under dry farmed organic conditions. These are potatoes that um, yield well and produce well and perform well under dry farming conditions. And so this plot has all the varieties that we've chosen for the 2020 uh, season. And this is the second year that we've done it. And we're gonna overview uh, some of these. Right now we're looking at one of our varieties called Desiree. And this variety is one of the varieties that we've chosen to evaluate. Uh, Desiree is one of the better studied varieties in terms of uh, dry farming conditions. Um, what I'd like to highlight right now is the fact that they are in the Solnum family and so they produce potato-like fruits uh, and that comes from a flower early in the season. This is a flower from Papa Cacho which is another one of the varieties that we're looking at and so if the flower becomes pollinated, um, either from the pollen from this, from a from its particular flower, or the pollen from another flower, it will produce a berry. And if I break open this berry, um, you can actually see that there are some viable seeds in here. And each of those seeds will produce a unique plant. So one of our primary missions is to evaluate known good commercial varieties and see how they perform under organic dry farm conditions here in the Pacific Northwest and um, present that data in a way that can be used by anybody that has access to these varieties in other bioregions. One of the things that we're also looking at is discovering which traits allow a variety to perform well under dry farmed conditions in organic settings and to breed new potatoes that hopefully can uh, beat the best of what is already available and that is why these berries are so important or at least the concept of getting berries it's because we often think of a seed potato as the tuber that's underneath the ground and colloquially, that's correct, but scientifically, these are berries which have the true seed and create true potato seedlings, which we can remix up the genetics and hopefully find a variety that will excel better in these conditions. This is a different part of the field. Uh, we're dealing with red Pontiac here and Papacacho. These two different varieties have different maturity times. Red Pontiac is, a, is an early variety. Papacacho is a late variety. And the difference between these two, I, I, wanna, sh I wanna illustrate varieties that, that, that are drying down appropriately and varieties that are having trouble with that. And so we're looking for varieties that have uniform dry down and and what does that mean and you can see here on this red pontiac that this variety is not drying down due to stress from lack of water but it's drying down due to maturity 
And one sign that we know that that's true is that the leaves here become crispy and the vine is still remaining upright and eventually it will begin to desiccate and flop down a little bit but you're not having the whole vine basically get shocked and dry down that way and one example of a variety that appears to be having uh, drought tolerance and some drought intolerance is this papacacho. This papacacho vine is still green, but you notice that the, these leaves down here are beginning to uh, yellow and brown. And so they'll, they'll dry down and then the vine will begin looking much like uh, papacacho in a, little, in, in, a, in a short time. But this particular papacacho is having issues. You can see that it's kind of systematically uh, having drought stress. And this actually is not caused by genetics, but it's caused by an attack that the plant has had from a gopher. Gopher has been digging at its base or something else has been digging at its base and exposing the roots to drying to the air, which is drying out the plant and causing the plant to prematurely dry down. So, um, while this variety seem, seems to be drought tolerant, um, things can make the, a specific plant drought intolerant or specific conditions can make a plant drought intolerant. So that's something that we have to bear in mind. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris is uh, on with us today and he'll be joining us for a question and answers at the end. And uh, Chris has a wealth of knowledge on potatoes and all these varieties. So in the chat box, as you have questions, feel free to go ahead and type those in and we'll go through them in the order that they're received at the end. So this next uh, video is with uh, our uh, farmer participants at Marion Polk Food Share Youth Farm. So Jared Hibbard Swanson and Stephanie Smith uh, were kind enough to uh, participate in this, uh, in this video you're about to see of their potato plot and share a little bit about some of their observations and why they're doing this. And they are located in uh, Salem, Oregon. Or I'm sorry, near, near Salem, Oregon at least. August 4th in Salem, Oregon at the Youth Farm run by Mary and Polk Food Share. Um, I work for the Youth Farm. My name is Stephanie Smith. Um, and it's a collaboration between Mary and Polk Food Share runs the farm, but uh, we lease the land from Chemeketa Community College. So we're kind of in the back of their campus. Um, it's historically, it's a seasonal creek bed. So it, um, it can be very marshy in the winter. Uh, We've got a high water table, which works out really well for the dry farming we've been trialing. Um, and uh, we're primarily a youth farm, an educational farm. So uh, a lot of our crop plan is designed around, you know, not only production, but also education for the 14 to 18 year olds that um, help us farm here. They do everything from um, plant when they show up, uh, you know, late spring and uh, through the through the early fall, they're planting, weeding, harvesting, washing, packing, um, and so they're a huge part of you know how we organize our farm around here. Uh, they're part of the re you know the educational experience is definitely part of the reason we got into dry farming. But um, this is the fourth year we've done it here on the farm. Um, the first year, I think we started with tomatoes. Um, and have done some melons in the past successfully. And this is our first year with our dry farm potatoes behind me. Um, it is, you know, for us, like I said, we have a high water table, so it has been really successful for us. We've noticed some lower weed pressure um, because we're not irrigating our fields, which is always nice, um, and less maintenance. Also dealing with irrigation is, you know, if we don't have to, uh, that's, that's great. Um, We've got 
a youth crew leader um, that does our irrigation for us. So he's pretty, um, pretty occupied with all the things we do irrigate on the farm. So it's nice to be able to block out a couple of fields and say we're not irrigating those. Um, so our potatoes, we haven't watered at all this year. We didn't water them at planting. We planted uh, a little late around, I think May 28th was our planting date. Um, and then uh, we don't have a lot of equipment, so we didn't get them in too deep. We just uh, dragged a, a hoe through the field and that was our furrow. Um, and then a month and a half later, I think on July 1st was our first hilling. And then three weeks after that, um, July 21st, was our uh, mulching. And we mulched with um, leaves, uh, primarily for a trial. Um, we're, we haven't harvested yet, so not exactly sure um, how that did. But, um, you know, we had the leaves here on the farm, um, and they did a great job suppressing weeds. Um, and they shaded the plants a little bit, I think. Um, so close up on some of our potato varieties. Uh, on the left here is the Belmonda. Um, it's already set flower, um, but still seems to be, uh, you know, very upright, still green. The Caribe is the variety that we've noticed by far is the first to dry down for us here. Um, and then over here um, on the right is the Papagacho, and that one is the tallest potato plants we have out here and that one still seems to be flowering and putting on some growth so um, that'll be really curious to see um, you know what the harvest windows for those are um, we did do a little digging around on the caribe which is our our first potato to dry down um, and we found some good looking tubers i don't know if you can see that there There we go. Yeah, yeah. beautiful rose. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so that's exciting um, to see. We did these at the uh, at the recommended, you know, dry farm recommended two feet spacing. So, and that is further apart than we've done in the past when we've done irrigated potatoes. Uh, so I'm really curious to see what the yield will be like. Um, but it's encouraging to see, you know, some beautiful succulent potatoes in the ground there. Yeah. Sorry. So that was, uh, of course, Marion Polk Food Share. And thank you. I think Jared's uh, on there with us. Thank you, Jared and Stephanie, if you're with us as well. I really appreciate you all uh, participating and being open to video. I think. Um, video is uh, not necessarily a comfortable thing for most of us. Uh, next, we have uh, Gales Meadow Farm, another one of our participating trial sites. And they're going to share some highlights uh, of some of their preferred varieties. And then uh, we also had the opportunity to have lunch uh, there. And they prepared German Butterball and Caribe the same way. So you get to hear some feedback from uh, the farm crew there on those two varieties after tasting them. And uh, since we're not really able to do our in-person group tastings this year, I think it's great to still have uh, some feedback on the varieties and how they do well in a culinary situation. So we'll get to uh, hear a little bit about that from Gail's Meadow. Oh, sorry, I have to go back here. All right. potato patch with the 10 or 12 kinds that we got from Oregon State University. Um, plus, we have two whole rows of um, red Pontiac. We got those seeds from Fillory Farm, which produces wonderful organic seed garlic and seed potatoes. Um, and in 2016, the first year we grew stuff as part of the program, uh, OSU gave us red Pontiacs. They were incredibly good. They were the most productive of all the dry farm. Um, and uh, one of our chef customers said that they were the ideal potato for um, making gnocchi and we love gnocchi. So we're a great believer in red Pontiac. 
Um, we do have one kind of potato that we do irrigate, and that's because we tried it two ways, once one dry farming and one irrigated. Um, it's got a really nice, strong, earthy flavor, and when it was dry farmed, the earthiness was a little bit over the top. So we do grow Macaos at, with irrigation, and that and Red Pontiac are two, uh, the two kinds of potatoes we grow the most. This is Red Pontiac, the one that's been the, given us the best yield, and it's just fantastically delicious. So we'll see if it's going to be a big yield. It's the first one we've pulled this year. Can you bring the big fork over here, Jen? Sure. Oh, look at these potatoes. These are gorgeous. I'm just gonna, there's a little bit of a time lapse here, but I'm gonna go ahead and speed this up a little bit because there it takes a few minutes to get through the harvest and then we'll see a snapshot of what one plant looks like. One plant, with, with right? Some of the others. Yep. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Here I can pile them together. Oh yeah. German Butterball is kind of like buttery tasting. It's very dense and and a little heavy and it's very creamy. Um, so yeah, my probably mashed potatoes would be really good, but I, I really like the creaminess and the heaviness. Mm -hmm. You'd have to really pair it with something very light, like cucumber salad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> Anyone else have any uh, feedback on those? I think I too enjoyed the German Butterball more. I feel like the other one, the Caribe, it is good. Definitely very potatoy still, but a little on the like drier side, but maybe that was just my difference in cutting it. I don't know, but they're both really so. good. If yeah. I had to choose, I'm a German butterball. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> what about you, Anne? Okay, <clears throat> I also, I like them both. They are very different, which is really fun to notice. Um, I like the German Butterball better because I do like the little bit more flavor and creaminess. But I'm thinking, you know, like for home fries, Caribe is going to be really, really good. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. being a little lighter, it'll absorb more of that bacon grease. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Nicole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it'll, it'll yeah. hold its uh, shape maybe a little better. Mm -hmm. um, but they're both great, and what a treasure to get to eat potatoes mm -hmm. right out of the ground virtually last week, but still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any feedback? Um, I, I agree with uh, German Butterball is my favorite, definitely. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, very creamy. I definitely want big old bowl of mashed potatoes from that, and yes. Mm -hmm. And I'll try your home fries anytime, Anne, if you want to whip those mm -hmm. up with the Caribbean, I'm sure it'll be good. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, so um, in a, I just wanted to point out that uh, everybody's taste and preference for these different varieties is, um, is kind of subjective. Everybody has like a different preference typically, but um, Cassandra Waterman, um, one of our uh, field research assistants uh, gave some feedback here on her opinion of, of Caribe. And uh, I think this is our final video and then we'll move on to just sharing some preliminary, re preliminary results and then moving into some uh, Q&A session here. Hey Amy, what do you got there? Got some Caribe oh, potatoes. My favorite! So, this Caribe potato, look at how big it is. It's as big as my hand. They have these beautiful purple flesh skin, 
and inside they're white and fluffy, so they make the perfect baked potato. It's like biting into a snowflake. <laughs> All right, we, uh, we like to have fun with this too, so um, I appreciate Cassandra's input there on that one. I loved her excitement about that variety, and it seems like different folks have different, uh, have excitement about different varieties. So thank you, Gail's Meadow Farm and Cassandra for that. So I, I shared with you briefly a snapshot of our harvest results on July 31st. So our next harvest date was the following week and uh, we were harvesting some of the same varieties there. So Caribe, Corolla, German Butterball, French Fingerling and uh, mostly marketable tubers, but you can see there is a little bit of um, orange there which is indicating the amount of unmarketable tubers and we'll share what those were in a second and then uh, the next week we started to see more varieties becoming ready so uh, red pontiac desiree and cyclamen and pinto gold were other was kind of the next wave of uh, varieties to dry down and become ready for harvest so you can see there's quite a bit of unmarketable tubers there on the red Pontiac. So we'll show some pictures of that. Um, I mentioned earlier, we did see a lot of ro rodent damage this year, but there were a few other issues going on, but uh, most of the tubers we were harvesting were uh, unblemished and perfectly mar marketable, but quite a bit more red Pontiacs there were unmarketable in our plots here in the Corvallis, Albany area. So this is just showing you uh, for the range of uh, from seven, uh, from July 31st to August 13th, this is kind of the average yield per plant that we saw across those two sites. And um, yeah, there's a wider range here uh, for the red Pontiac, that bar is larger because um, some of the plants had more damage than others. So, um, just the snapshot there. And so this is only uh, captures the varieties that we've harvested so far. We will be harvesting all the other varieties as well. And our participating sites, we actually got one of our first data sheets in uh, from uh, Christina and Mike Bose in Sheridan, Oregon. They uh, sent their data uh, for their variety trial, which they uh, trialed four of our earlier varieties. and. So we'll be integrating our on-farm trial results with our research site results. So when you uh, see that those orange portion of the, bar, of the bars there, those are the represent the unmarketable yield. And uh, I mentioned rod rodent damage, but um, that picture there at the bottom on the top is a red Pontiac potato. And what we were seeing on some of those is scab and um, and then on the bottom there, uh, also on those red Pontiacs, we were seeing some cracking. Some of the, I don't have that pictured here, but we were seeing some splitting of the tubers. And um, also at the bottom, those are, those are pinto gold. Those are those red and white uh, skin potatoes. Uh, had quite a bit of wireworm damage. So we're seeing different varieties have different amounts of damage. But this publication on the right-hand side is free and available online. You can search what's wrong with my uh, with my potato tubers and uh, Alex Stone and Lane Selman um, and a couple other folks put this publication out back in 2008. So that's a good reference. Some of the uh, problems that we have with tubers in the Pacific Northwest are apparently a little different than what uh, folks see in other areas. So uh, that's all we have for our virtual field tour. I really want to just quickly thank you, Tegan Moran and Matt Davis for all their help with video editing and uh, uh, also Chris Homanix um, for leading us and selecting these varieties and participating also in the videos for this field tour. Um, Brad and Cassandra and Maricos, you're not mentioned here, but uh, these are our, our crew this year, student workers helping us uh, manage all these trials. Uh, Gail's Meadow Farm, Marion Polk Food Share, uh, your willingness to be on camera for this is much appreciated. And uh, our variety trials this year were supported with funds raised by the Dry Farming Institute. So um, 
our purchasing our seed potatoes each year is uh, it takes a bit of support and we're really grateful for that as well. Mm -hmm.